coarse fishing country. There are coarse fish everywhere, except in those places where men have been allowed to save their private pockets by poisoning the public water. But there are some counties in which, when men speak of fishing, coarse fishing is meant. Counties in which roach and bream, carp and tench, perch and pike are not the tolerated second cousins, the poor relations of the trout and salmon, but have things all their own way and yield precedence to none. We have pike and perch in plenty in the lake country, but few fish for them who can fish for trout. There is magnificent coarse fishing in Shropshire, but trout are there also. Neither Shropshire nor the lake country, nor any of the land that lies between them, can be considered the exclusive domain of those fish which, having no adipose fins, submit disdainfully to being called coarse, even by those who prize them at their proper worth. That exclusive realm of theirs is the country south of the Humber and east of the last hills. They flourish in sluggish waters and do not love the stony-bottomed rivers which hurry down the steep valleys where the rocks are near the surface of the soil. The trout and salmon fisher thinks of Scotland and the north as his own country. The coarse fisher thinks of a land so unlike this that it is difficult to believe that they can both be parts of the same island. I came to that country by way of Leeds, leaving the great trout rivers, Loon, Ribble and Wharf in flood, and working eastwards to the valley of the Trent. The Trent is not what it used to be, though if the polluters will give it a chance it may again become what it was in the days when J. W. Martin wrote his delightful books about its barbel, chub and pike. After crossing the Trent it was almost as if I had crossed the North Sea. There were the square sails of barges moving before the wind among the rain-soaked crops. Here and there were windmills. The road ran along the top of a dike above a canal where the ripples of fish turning on the surface continually invited me to stop. And so to Brig and the Ancombe, where the Sheffield men ply the little light rods, the toothpick floats, and the lightly shotted casts that are so strange a contrast to the heavy shotting and the long cork-covered floats of the men of Nottingham. A contrast strange only to those who have not compared the waters where these styles developed. Who that has read it can forget old Martin's description of the great float that was made for him to carry a dozen shot and two big pike leads. But that float was for the fishing of a swim twenty-five and thirty feet deep in water where less lead would have failed to keep the bait to the bottom. Here, in the Ancombe, a single shot is enough, and that is carried near the float, so that the bait, instead of being forced downwards, sinks slowly at its own speed, the only solid mouthful in a cloud of rapidly evanescent ground bait. The Ancombe was in flood, and though it was possible to take fish in it in the Trent style, I saw some Sheffield men turn from it in dudgeon to ply their special craft in some ponds nearby. From the Ancombe, where just before the flood a local angler landed a golden tench of four pound ten ounces, I turned south to the Witham and the Welland, through a country absolutely flat, where the highest mountains are the dikes, where the sky is as wide and the horizon as level as on the plains of Russia. In this country, except in the towns, are no large houses, the cowsheds are the biggest buildings. Travelling hither and thither about it, from one famous drain or river to another, I saw in many days outside the towns no single building that would be described by an auctioneer as a gentleman's residence. The houses are small, as if those who built them feared that they might drop through into the mud if they were a brick or two too heavy. They are small boxes built of brick, often with a weatherproof coating of black tar. They are in keeping with the tradition of the country, the descendants of the huts of the fenmen, hidden here and there with their eel traps among the reeds of the swamps. The swamps have been drained, dikes built, and the fenmen live now on the edges of the drains, no longer in impregnable fastnesses of swamp and water. But this was never a country where it was worthwhile to own much land. A man wanted room for a hut, a landing place for his boat, and the whole wilderness of reeds and waters was as much his as anybody else's. The great drains cutting the map in a series of parallel straight lines, 
the neat roads following the drains for miles along the tops of the imprisoned dikes, give the country now an orderliness that makes it easy to forget how long it survived in wildness parts of England that we still think not wholly tamed. Here are no rivers with babbling shallow, narrow gorge, deep pool and restful eddy, but streams between banks almost as regular as those of the drains, and with scarcely more motion in them, hundreds of miles of still water, and in it the finest coarse fishing in England. There is no strong water, except at flood time, and very little deep. Wind, not current, dictates the shotting of the cast. Except in a very few places, you fish always with mile upon mile of water stretching on either side of you. In appearance, exactly like the water before you. Between banks, exactly like the bank on which you sit. Here is nothing to distract the mind. Here, indeed, is the rigour of the game. Canal fishing, if you like, but canal fishing of superlative quality. The middle level drain near King's Lynn, where I saw those big bream pulled out a week ago, is like a railway cutting filled with water. So is the 40 foot. So in miniature are the north and south drove, the counter drain, the hob hole, the bell water, and all these other famous places. From all parts of England, men come to fish these waters, and those who have come once come year after year. Nor are the fen men themselves without great pride in their possession. In Boston, in Spalding, in Surfleet, men talk with hushed voices of great tench and bream. In Spalding, the local anglers not only return all small ones to the waters, but bring their large ones, carefully lapped in wet cloths, to their secretary, who, if they are not to go into glass cases, turns them into a pond in some gardens belonging to the town, where the fishermen can call upon them, and watching them grow to yet greater weights, recall the glory of their capture. Coarse fish, indeed? There is no place in England where the captured trout can look forward to a pension and such honour in his old age. Carp. August and September are the best in the year for carp fishing, and it is pleasant to turn to the carp from such fish as trout and salmon which put a less insistent strain upon the nerves. But not too often. A man who fishes habitually for carp has a strange look in his eyes. I have known several, and have even shaken hands respectfully with a man who caught the biggest carp ever landed in England. He looked as if he had been in heaven and in hell and had nothing more to hope from life. Though he survived, and after six years caught an eighteen-pounder to set beside the first. Carp fishing combines enforced placidity with extreme excitement. You may, day after day, for weeks, watch your rod fishing on your behalf, for you do not hold it in your hand, and then, at last, you see your float rise and move off, and, striking with proper delay, are suddenly connected to the fastest fish that swims. A salmon keeps it up longer, but I doubt if even he has the carp's appalling pace. Trout are slow, dogged creatures in comparison. Further, carp are immensely strong. To hold them safely, you need stout gut. But to use stout gut is to throw away most chances of having a carp to hold. There is something terrifying about these fish. To hook a big one is like being jerked out of bed by a grapnel from an aeroplane. Their speed, size and momentum are enhanced in their effect upon the mind by the smallness and stillness of the ponds in which they are to be found. The pleasantest such place I know is the lake in front of a tower that Cromwell burnt, a placid pool where frogs spawn in spring, with ancient trees on the still more ancient dam that holds it up. These trees have, during the storms of several centuries, dropped branch after branch into the lake, and the bottom there is rich with decaying leaves and fortresses for fish. You cast out and pray, one, that you may not hook an oak bough, and two, that if you hook a carp, he may neglect the snags on either side of him and give you just a slightly better chance of catching him by burying himself in the water lilies in the middle of the lake. You cast out, I say. 
Alas, there is no longer anything to cast for. The lake was drained for its fish during the war, and the men who took them took even fingerlings, and left nothing alive that they could see. The carp in that lake, however, did not run very large. There were a few big ones killed when it was drained, but nothing of the size I saw at the weak end in a duck pond that could scarcely have covered two acres. This pond was square and used for washing sheep. There was a little wooded island in it and a sunken willow tree. Its banks were almost without bushes. It was simply a shallow bathtub of a pond. It had not even water lilies. It looked as if it had no fish. When I came to the pond side, I believed I'd been misled and was consoled by watching a flock of wild Canada geese resting beside it. For some minutes they took no notice of me. Then, altogether, twelve or thirteen of them, they raised their long black necks and a moment later rose into the air, cleared the hedge and, lifting slowly, flew away. I was still watching them when I heard something like a cartwheel fall into the pond. Huge rings showed, even on the windswept surface. I watched for a particularly clumsy diving bird to come up again. None came. But just as a gleam of sunshine opened the racing clouds, there was another vast splash, and a huge, pale gold fish rose into the air, shook himself in a cloud of spray, gilded by the sunshine and his own colour in the midst of it, and fell heavily back into the water. In a few minutes after that, the rods were up and the baits cast out. With the helping wind, it was easy to get them well out towards the middle of the lake. The floats were adjusted so as to lie on the surface, held by the resting shot, while the bait, with a couple of feet of fine gut, lay on the bottom. The placidity of floats so adjusted is like that of anchored ships. Life has left them. They lie dead on the top of the water. They do not drift. There is no feeling that they may be approaching a fish. All that can be hoped is that down below on the mud a fish is approaching them. The fisherman can do no more. A yard or two of line lies on the ground beside his reel. Until that line is drawn out he must do nothing. He is immobilized while tremendous events impend. Chained hand and foot he waits on destiny. And destiny, rumbling here and there with terrific splashes of golden leviathans, makes havoc of his nerves. He cannot, like the trout fisher, find expression and relief in lengthening his line and casting over a rise. He must steel himself to leave his rod alone, and this enforced inaction in the exciting presence of huge fish visibly splashing produces a sort of drugged madness in the fisherman. I could not keep my hands still, nor could I reply sanely to questions. A true record of the life of an habitual carp fisher would be a book to set beside De Quincey's Confessions of an English Opium Eater, a book of taut nerves, of hallucinations, of a hypnotic state. It is possible to stare afloat into invisibility, of visions Japanese in character, of great blunt-headed golden fish in golden spray curving in the air under sprays of weeping willow and then rare moments when this long-drawn-out tautness of expectation is resolved into a frenzy of action. When, at last, I hooked one of these fish, I could not keep in touch with him. Though I was using an American multiplying reel with which, on a trout rod, I have kept easily in touch with a salmon. Again and again he won yards of slack, and yet, when he was landed, he was no glass-case fish, but quite an ordinary carp, which at the end of the day I put back into the pond. For carp fishing, it was a lucky day. Four times the baits were taken by eels, landed amid anathemas, tempered by the thought of next day's breakfast. Four times they were taken by carp. One fish was landed. Twice the carp shot off with such speed that the reel overran, checked and gave him warning. On the fourth occasion, one of the monsters made a direct run of thirty yards and then broke me, the fine gut cast parting above the float. There then occurred an incident that illustrates the uncanny nature of these fish. My float, lying out in the middle of the pond, turned 
and sailed slowly in again to my very feet, towed by the monster, who then in some manner freed himself, thus returning me my tackle with a sardonic invitation to try again. No other fish is capable of putting so fine a point on irony. <laughs>